Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to day two of the 2020 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Colby Smith. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it's my honor to introduce the following panel, Se Pass the Secret Sauce, Learning Across Sports. Our panelists today, going from left to right, are Robert Einhorn, General Director, AZ Alkmaar, Joe Sill, Analytics Consultant with the Washington Wizards, Luke Bourne, VP of Analytics with the Sacramento Kings, and Monty McNair, Assistant General Manager for the Houston Rockets. This panel is moderated by Tom Haberstrow. Tom is the uh, NBA insider for NBC Sports. This panel is going to last for 45 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. If you'd like to submit a question for the panelists, you can do so on Twitter using the hashtag SecretSauce. And with, with that, I'll pass it off to Tom. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, you're still around here uh, on a Saturday afternoon, so thanks for sticking around. Uh, we've got a great uh, group of panelists here today to talk about um, just cross-pollination across all sports. And uh, uh, I came into this space, the, covering the NBA, actually through baseball, um, uh, through the back door. Uh, I was trying to be in finance and trying to be like all you Sloan students and getting uh, an iBanking job or something cool like that, and then market crashed in 2008 when I graduated college and took a $12 internship at ESPN and worked my way through. And here I am on this panel, but a lot of the skills that I got trying to be in finance, I applied to my new job because not a lot of reporters, I've never taken a journalism class, not a lot of reporters like looking at spreadsheets, and I do. So uh, it's kind of um, one of the things that this panel is going to be about is taking skills from one area, one domain, and applying it to uh, whatever sport you're in. And I'm super excited. Robert uh, played Major League Baseball. Uh, he ran the Netherlands uh, baseball national team for, what, 14 years? Uh, so uh, now he's running a soccer team. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Joe Sill came from kind of like a hedge fund, uh, machine learning at Caltech, and did a cool thing at Netflix, and then his favorite team is the Washington Wizards. He's from DC area, and then applied a lot of the stuff that he learned over there in the hedge fund world, or just machine learning, and it worked out on the basketball side. And then uh, Luke <laughs> is now with the Sacramento Kings, running their analytics, but also spent some time at AS, AS Roma uh, overseas, running the analytics for them. And here, you played football at Princeton, apparently? Yeah. Yeah, it was about 30 pounds ago, but <laughs> it did happen. Monty is now with the Houston Rockets uh, and played football at Princeton. Um, I have a rant about football real quick. Is why, why do we have soccer players? And I know this is all about like stealing ideas from other sports and seems kind of backwards, but I think it's terrible we have soccer players deciding football games. Yeah, well, so I... It's I, a whole game of football, and you bring in a soccer player to <laughs> kick a field goal Mm -hmm. And he's not even a football player. I, I feel that I can speak on this because I was also a kicker as well as a wide receiver. Oh, no. And I, and, <laughs> but I, I agree. I agree. I think that you should make one of the guys on the field kick the field goal. So yes. You can't just bring him in from the sideline. So, so. don't have specialized. No specialists. Uh, yeah. No specialists, just people like yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then I, yeah, they would You could be have, in the NFL. I, I should be in the NFL. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're, you were like made famous here at the Sloan Conference. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> while I had a chance, I wanted to uh, take a moment to, to thank the conference. Um, I um, presented a paper here, and I won an award here 10 years ago, um, and that really helped kick off my MBA career. And so I wanted to tell a quick story about what a big moment that was for me. Um, and one of the reasons it was such a big moment was when I went up on stage to receive my award, uh, Bill Simmons was uh, sitting right behind me because... Uh, there was a panel that was about to start. So they already had the panelists up on the stage. Um, and so, uh, um, so it was like Bill is sitting where I am, and I'm, I'm right up there. And also, uh, Kevin Pritchard was sitting in the, the front row of the audience, front and center, right, right in front of the stage. And uh, he was the GM of the Trailblazers at the time. And I had just started a little remote internship with the Blazers. So, um, so I just started working with him. And, um, so the, the one other piece of background I should mention is uh, um, just a few weeks before that conference in 2010, uh, Bill Simmons had said on his podcast that he hated adjusted plus minus. Okay? He said he thought <laughs> adjusted plus minus was stupid. So 
So anyway, so I'm, so I'm standing there on stage, um, and they announce my award. Uh, Joe Sill wins for his paper on improved adjusted plus minus. And it's, you know, it's my big moment of glory. The whole ballroom's applauding me, and Kevin Pritchard's in the front row cheering me on, like, yeah, Joe, way to go, Joe. <laughs> and then I hear this sarcastic voice behind me, and, uh, and I hear Bill um, just say, like, oh, great. Just what we need. So I got a kick out of that. Um, but, uh, uh, great, another uh, analytics guy with yeah. his words, ruining the basketball. But, but I just wanted to say that I, it's not that, that Bill ruined my moment. It, 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 it was very much enhanced. I, I, uh, I enjoyed it all the much more for that. Well, welcome back. Yeah. Now you're on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, congrats. And uh, I, I think... People assume that you invented adjusted plus minus, but you did not invent it. You just were like, hey, this strategy that we did in the finance world and hedge fund world, why can't we just do it here? Um, yeah, so that's right. So, so just to be clear, I, as I understand it, Wayne Winston was the, the main guy that, that set up the, the, um, the adjusted plus minus model. And, and then there were some um, people like uh, uh, Dan Rosenbaum and Steve Velarde that did important early work. Um, and I, I would say the, the, the technique that I adapted, I would say it was more from um, either statistics or machine learning than, than finance specifically. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's safe to say that it's a better way to estimate the player ratings. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, that, I, adjusted plus minus did exist before, uh, um, before me. But. So you didn't invent hockey plus minus? I can't uh, attribute that to you. No, yeah, so, well, no, the, well, obviously, the, like, the basic plus minus has been around for, I don't, I don't know, many, many, many decades. But, um, but uh, Brian McDonald is now with the SPN. He adapted my paper to hockey. And, uh, yeah, it seems to be uh, quite, quite popular within the, the hockey community now. Like, there's a big community on, on Twitter and sites like Evolving Hockey. So that's been cool to see, to see it spread. Yeah. Well, there's a great book about this topic. It's called um, Range, David Epstein, last year. I went against him. Um, my panel was the same time that David Epstein was talking to Malcolm Gladwell, and the crowd was like three people. <laughs> so I'm happy this, this year uh, didn't have that, but he wrote a great book, David Epstein, uh, Range, which is you know, how generalists are triumphing in a, in a world of specialists. And there is a quote in there from a scientist, Arturo Casadival, who's probably super famous in another world. I, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. But um, he calls it the system of parallel trenches, that the, the scientific community has become a system of parallel trenches. And I feel like sports worlds are uh, a system of parallel trenches that people like you, Robert, you might have been a baseball player and exposed to the American baseball system, but some things that you learned in American baseball or things that they didn't do well uh, or things that you did well carry over into another sport. So the thing that you need to do is, as he said, the system maintains you in a trench. You have all these parallel trenches and it's very rare that anybody stands up and actually looks at the next trench to see what they are doing and it's often related. So when you stood up and saw what was going on in this trench. How did you apply some of the things that you learned in the baseball trench into soccer? Um, well, first of all, I was thinking about the fact that you don't want a game to be cited, uh, decided by a kick, and, and you call it football. But that's <laughs> what I think. Um, no, but I, I, was, I was very lucky uh, uh, to come over here and, and, and play baseball for, uh, I think, close to 10 years. Um, and met a lot of good people, a lot of smart people. And I, uh, I was asked in, uh, in 2014, after taking over the baseball program in the Netherlands for 14 years, uh, if I wanted to uh, become a CEO of a, of a soccer organization. And I would every year, uh, since 2011, have breakfast with, with Billy, Billy, uh, Billy uh, being uh, in Arizona, and I told him, I said, you know what, I've been asked to, uh, to run a, a soccer organization. And he said, well, <clears throat> you're six foot three, you should do it. And, uh, Wait, what? <laughs> six foot three, you should do it. So he probably knew there was going to be some conflicts. I, I think that's what he meant with it. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I went over there. And, and uh, well, one of the big differences between uh, soccer at the time and still, still is right now and, and, and baseball is obviously that baseball was a lot uh, farther ahead uh, with, with all the data and all the analytics uh, than, than in soccer. Uh, in soccer, they did do a lot of stuff, analytics, uh, uh, when it was about uh, physical stuff.
but not so much when you actually uh, told a coach or a scout, you know, the guy you like is actually not that good. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I applied that to it, uh, to the organization, at least uh, gave them uh, some thoughts about it. And I think when you're new in the organization, first you always just observe and then you ask questions and then maybe you, you, do, you make some suggestions. And that's basically what we've, uh, what we've done over the last uh, five years. And uh, uh, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, and we got great people. I decided to do this job because the organization was an organization who had a volleyball guy run a soccer, soccer organization before me. So I thought it'd be a good, be, be a good uh, organization to start out uh, if I wanted to do something in soccer. And I grew up in the Netherlands, so I didn't come here until I was 19 years old. Uh, so I did see a lot of soccer. A lot of my friends became professional soccer players. So uh, I thought, you know, when you're around 45, 46, and you want to do something, really something different, then this is probably the time to do it. Is Billy, Billy Bean really good at identifying talent on the soccer field? Well, I tell you what, he's very good at identifying a good analyst uh, who then know what's, uh, what are good talents, yeah. Is it important to have that outside, I mean, do, why didn't you go into, uh, why didn't you stay in baseball? Why, why, what appealed to you going over to the soccer side? Did you feel like you had an advantage given that you're an outsider, quote unquote? Well, and you'd I, have a fresh perspective on the league? Yeah, no, I always like to, 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 to do new things. Uh, to, uh, try to take different paths and, and uh, I've been doing, I was doing baseball for 14 years and we were a fairly small country and we won the World Cup in 2011, although with players like Sander Bogers and, and Didi Gregorius, so we did have some talent. Um, and it just got to the point where you just get a feeling like you're doing the same thing over and over each day and uh, so it just, it just felt right to really get out of your comfort zone and do something outside the bubble that we all created uh, in, in, in the things that we were doing every day. And I just thought, you know, it's a good time to do it. And Luke, you can always fall back if it doesn't work out. How good is his soccer club? Yeah, he's not tooting his own horn enough. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing to note about, about soccer, and this is especially across Europe, the, the, the spending disparity from the smallest club to the highest club is massive. You know, because we have floors and, and caps and aprons and all this kind of stuff, we get massive compression of, of team spend across North American sports. In the NBA. Yeah. In the NBA. So we do get a little bit more disparity in MLB, but the disparity that, that, that they have in the Netherlands or other leagues have is, is about two to three times what you see in the MLB. And yet... The haves and have-nots. Is just, right. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So um, the haves and the have-nots, yeah, exactly. It's, it's about a, you know, a 10x multiple on spend. So it'd be like in, in basketball if... You know, if the Kings were spending a hundred and another team was spending a billion, right? That's the disparity we're dealing with, or they're dealing with, I should say. So, um, and you know, he's essentially taking on juggernauts, IX and Feyenoord, and they're top of the table. So, you just told me 30 minutes ago your your game just finished up, or your match just finished up, and you guys are now in first place. At least for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> the other team's got to play. When you went over to uh, Europe uh, for Roma, what was kind of the biggest shock? as a basketball mind going over there? Yeah, there's a lot of things that shocked me. Um, one of the things was just not realizing how far behind they were in terms of, not even necessarily analytical adoption, just thinking quantitatively and thinking objectively. Like our sporting director's sort of MO for identifying talent was to like give them a stack of VHSs basically and a carton of cigarettes. Wait, recently? Yeah, yeah, this is a few years ago. So like, and then, you know, you'd stick them in the, I'm joking about the VHS, but yeah, you'd, you'd get this, <laughs> basically, you'd get this video, carton of cigarettes, lock himself in his office for a day, and come out and say, we're signing this guy. You know, wow. that was the process. And uh, I thought that was in Moneyball only, like in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, it's real. real. It's definitely real. So, you know, to, to, to just walk into that kind of environment was, was, uh, was it so, sort of felt like I was stepping back in time in a way. And for you, Monty, you, you were playing in the Ivy League football. Uh, you were at Stats LLC after, after college. But what about the football culture going into basketball culture with the Houston Rockets? Yeah, I mean, at the time, I kind of made three transitions. So football to basketball, obviously collegial to um, professional, and then obviously a player uh, into a front office. So there was a lot of changes. But, uh, you know, football is very uh, – you got way more players, right? It's a, a more of a structured – um, in some ways, militaristic environment. And then, uh, you know, you go to professional basketball, we're very a player-driven league. And, uh, you know, much more like player-friendly coaches and things like that. So 
Um, so that was a little bit of a change. Um, but, you know, a lot of similarities. I mean, you're, you're a team, you're trying to, uh, you know, work towards a common goal. And, and so a lot of those things, you know, stayed applicable, I think. Do, do you, like, if, let's say you're hiring. Let's say you're GM. Daryl Morey's gone. He's out. Okay. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's playing ping pong somewhere. Um, when you had a candidate, I don't know if you review candidates to join your front office, but if you had a candidate, all else equal, but candidate A has been for the last 10 years just popping around on different sports. So he's soccer one year, tennis one year, and baseball. Or this other candidate's been in the NBA for, like, 10 years. Which candidate, all else equal, would you want to bring in? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, all else equal is obviously important, but, um, but that first candidate is going to have so much broader of, a, of a experiences to draw upon. And the, all the other experience that you kind of gain, you know, that can be learned um, once you come over to basketball. So I, I think that could be really interesting. Um, and and um, a lot of the problems when you're you know, you're in something for too long is uh, a lot of groupthink, right? You kind of get, you know, set in your ways in, in a little bit. And so bringing people in from, from other sports or, or even other industries can, can sometimes just bring that, that freshness. So I think I'd up for A. Do, do you feel a lot of blowback when you're like, hey, Scott Brooks, you should play this player. And he's like, ah, you're like, what do you know about basketball? Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a healthy dialogue. But, um, but yeah, for sure, the coaches have... Uh, have firm opinions and, and there's some back and forth, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's been a pretty good exchange. Um, but was it hard to like get them to buy in for someone who didn't play 20 years in the NBA? Mm -hmm. I, well, so I think it takes um, it takes time to develop uh, trust with the top decision makers, um, uh, but uh, um, uh, th there have been a number of uh, instances where we've forecasted some outcomes or, or said that. Certain players were going <clears> to <throat> impact things in certain ways that uh, were maybe somewhat surprising. Like the, the, like the conventional wisdom would not have have uh, predicted that, but it's played out that way. And so over time, I think you do build up trust. It was harder ten years ago when uh, um, when I started. Like the, the, the analytics weren't as established, but. So it's, yeah, it's a process, but it's, it's gone pretty well on the whole, I think. Yeah. So I feel like there's this been wave at Sloan, even like Australian sports scientists come into uh, the league and it doesn't work out. And a lot of it has to do with cultural differences with uh, an Australian who's never played basketball before telling an NBA player, like, here's what you should do with your body. And NBA players are like, nah. I'm not listening. What do you know about what my body? Like, you've never picked up a basketball. So mm -hmm. in your experience, Luca, how do you get over, overcome those cultural differences if... If you have an accent, even having an accent might make you seem foreign. Like, I'm not listening to you. Yeah, that's, it's a challenge for sure. When I, when I went to Roma, Jim, Paul, who brought me in, sort of called me the, the basketball guy. And it's the exact same thing at the Kings. When I came in, Vivek was like, oh, we got this guy from soccer. So <laughs> yeah. you know, even though I've jumped between sports, like I, I've sort of always been the outsider in a way, which I, I certainly don't mind. But th there's definitely a cultural, there's cultural gaps. And some of the stuff you're talking about in terms of like injuries and, and uh, you know, things coming over from other sports, a lot of times it's actually just miscalibrated expectations. So in that particular example, I think this is a case of, of we don't necessarily interact enough with the other sports to know what's really going on. So like when I was at Roma, we had, I think it was either eight or nine ACLs in one year, which is crazy if you think about to have eight ACL tears in, in 12 months in, in a professional team. We were doing, like our sports science guys were the best in the world. They were doing everything right. And yet, somehow, when I came to basketball, when I came back to the Kings, there was still this impression like, oh, yeah, like you guys are doing the, all the best things in, in sports science, and you've solved injuries, and you know, we need to bring those ideas over. And I think, you know, that's not quite true. You know? So um, th there's, there's cultural pieces that need to be um, overcome, but also sort of a better understanding of what these other uh, sports do well and don't do well. Would the athletes on your... Uh soccer club be okay with Billy Bean coming in without that movie about, with Brad Pitt? Like, would they have been sold on that? On, on the idea of a baseball, a baseball executive coming in to give his insights about the club? No, but I think players, and I was a player myself, and coaches, I was a coach myself, uh, they, don't, they don't mind if somebody gives you information that actually helps you out because um, at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to get the credit. 
So I think it's all about communication. Uh, you know, how are you going to present that information to whether it's a player or whether it's a coach or whether it's uh, a sports director that, that, that I, uh, I work with uh, as well. Uh, when they see uh, that it helps them, you know, getting, getting better, then they will, they will take it. The mistake that is made is that if you made five good decisions out of ten the traditional way and you're making seven good decisions now out of ten the new way, you can still focus on those three times you're going to be wrong. Mm. But I'd rather f f you know, focus on, on, on the two times they were, they were actually, uh, ex extra right. And I can show them what that means on the field, and I can also show them what it means in the books. Uh, and it's, it's really my uh, job to make sure that uh, other people give the smart guys um, a platform uh, that they listen to it because we will use it. Um, and, and I heard it this morning, uh, ownership. So our, our, uh, our vice president is, is, was very into it. You know, when, when I first, I saw a poster in our, in our uh, uh, in our building, the first day I stepped in, it was, it was the Moneyball post, and I said, do you want to meet him? <clears throat> and he said, well, then I, I like to take my wife, too. I said, no, we're going to meet Billy, not Brett. <laughs> uh, but he, he, uh, he, was, he was into it from the get-go, and I think it's very important. If you, if you want to be successful, then the translators uh, of the vision have to think the same way. Otherwise, um, you're going to have, end up with a lot of frustrated people. Why, why didn't you go for it every fourth down at Princeton? <laughs> they didn't let the players make that decision. Uh, and, I mean, I think... Would you, the, would you, were, you, were you as a player being like, we it, should go for it on fourth? Every yeah, time. I mean, I, I, it, was, it was pretty new back then, but it was out there. And uh, the interesting thing, and I've talked about this with some of my friends who, uh, who work in football, is like some of the... Um, reasons to not go for it is, oh, the players will get discouraged. I mean, when we were players, we wanted to go for it every fourth down. And I was the kicker, man. I didn't <laughs> want to go out there and score my field goal. I wanted to score a touchdown. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that – I don't understand why that would be a, a hurdle. And to me, the, the only hurdle is, uh, is the, the book, and uh, I think that's been disproven. So I think uh, we're already starting to see a lot of it. But uh, uh, I can tell you Princeton now – uh, and one of my good friends was just the office of coordinator last year. Uh, they went for it a lot on fourth down, so uh, they're, they're on their way. Is that because, I mean, you guys chime in here, you think football just doesn't have cross-pollinate or new ideas coming into the sport? It's just a lot of people who've just been in football. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure why um, there isn't more adoption of going for fourth down, but what I will say, just on the theme of learning from different sports, um, I, I do see a theme across sports of, uh, and this was alluded to in the, the earlier panel with Bill James, he was talking about that, this a little bit, of um, slowly uh, teams are learning uh, across different sports to not get seduced by um, a high probability of a small positive payoff and instead to go for uh, decisions that are um, higher uh, expected value. Um, and so, so yeah, going, going for it um, instead of uh, punting on fourth down. You know, you punt, um, yeah, you'll, you'll probably gain whatever, 25 yards of field position, but it's not, as it turns out, it's not really a, a positive expected value move. Um, obviously, Monty knows very well about, you know, shooting threes instead of uh, long twos. And then the Wait, whole, why would Monty know a lot about shooting threes? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I, I, I think it's safe to say from observing a team anyway. That I, um, but, uh, um, uh, and yeah, and then and then in baseball, um, the the money ball ideas of um, not sack bunting and not um, uh, stealing a base. Like yes, that I think I think as Richard Thaler was saying, yes, that probably increases your odds of um, just scoring one run that inning, but it kills your odds of the the, the big inning. So it's um, uh, uh, not a proper uh, decision in terms of expected value. And then really what you want to look at is um, maximizing uh, win probability. And so there are some cases where you don't even want to do the, the positive expected value move, but if you're in desperate straits, you, you just um, have to maximize your odds, odds of winning. And in, in the hockey analytics panel, um, there was um, some discussion about uh, pulling the goalie. Um, and um, so in that case, um, yeah, yeah, if you pull the goalie with whatever, four minutes to go, um, yeah, you're the, like, you'll probably give up a bunch of empty netters, that, um, but once in a while you'll win a game that you would not have otherwise won, and so it's the correct decision. But that seems to be difficult psychologically, but I see 
across sports, I see um, you know, people learning that lesson, and we're making some progress. Yeah. And I think looking across sports gives you, you know, a bigger sample to be more confident that that is the reason, right? If it's just the one thing in your sport that you're maybe not being aggressive enough, that maybe there's another reason, but you see it over and over again in other sports, and that is the common theme, and now you're able to, yeah. you know, be more confident that that's, you know, something that... Um, that's that's probably happening, and now you can now you can make your, your other decisions. It's also helpful to see these other the people in other sports struggling against the established culture to, to implement these kind of decisions. So it's helpful to see these actually decision points happening. But it's also helpful to talk to someone who works at a, at a football team, and they say, "Man, like every day I got to beat this, you know, down the coach so that we're going to go for it on fourth downs or whatever tactical decisions." And so just knowing that like the struggle is real across all these sports. I think is helpful when you work, you know, in basketball or whatever, to know like, okay, like we got to keep pushing forward. This is just the path. Did Billy Bean come in and come with radical ideas that you were like, that would never work here? But that actually, that one might work. No, but like only an outsider coming into a situation would have suggested. No, no, no. He just, uh, we we just talked a lot and we we thought about a lot of things the same way, and he just had a lot more experience. So I was just uh, uh, trying to, you know, listen to him and, and to see how uh, the things that he was doing uh, in baseball we could actually implement in, in, in football or soccer. And it, it, it just, it, it takes a little while. It's not like one, overnight, you know, you're just going to change your whole entire system. I think for our organization, um, you, you, it's just looking for, for development and also trying to, to, with all the things we don't have, like in American sports, we don't have a draft, we don't have luxury tax, we don't have salary cap, so we really have to look for an edge, whatever that is. So there's really not much of a risk to take maybe a route that's, that, that's non-traditional, it's different, and uh, it, 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 has worked, uh, it has worked for us. And um, like I said, you know, we're lucky. I'm lucky to, to not only talk to him about these type of things, but everything that has to do with running a sports organization but also lucky with the talent that we have that, that, that are willing to do these models for us and, and make us better as an organization. I think it's interesting, the Rockets like, went with this like, pretty radical strategy of not playing with a seven-footer. And you would think that a team with a coach who doesn't have a long-term contract would be like, no, I'm trying to save my job here. I'm not going to do anything crazy. When you talk about fourth, fourth down in football, a lot of it is about like, job security. They don't want to... like lose their jobs, so if they screw up with a fourth down, they might lose their jobs, but it seems like for you guys, you just decided, hey, we're going to try this pretty crazy strategy and see if it works. Yeah, and uh, obviously credit to, to Coach D'Antoni, who's been innovating for de decades at this point, um, but I think, yeah, like organizationally, you know, it helps to, to kind of have that philosophy that, hey, we're, we're going to try stuff till, till it works, and uh, you know, and I think you can look across other sports and see, you know, what what they've done to to innovate. And you know, I think the Eagles obviously has had two huge fourth down conversions in their Super Bowl victory, right? And and see teams that have done that and and reap success. It just gives you a little more confidence to uh, to kind of go for it. But do you have do you have that uh, part of the in problem with innovating is that you don't have that sample size to tell you if it's a good idea or not? Yeah, somebody's got to be the first mover. <laughs> but I think, yeah, again, that's why maybe you're going to have to be the first mover in your sport. But if you've seen somebody else in another sport do it, you know that you at least have a little bit of, uh, you know, like, like, like Luke said, you get a little bit of a cover there. There's also another like, lesson there, which is that if your objective function is championship and that's all you want, you should be chasing volatility. You should be, like, if you follow the traditional path to, to, to try and get there, you're not... With the same, with actually more constricted resources, because if you're good consecutively, you don't get good draft picks, all that kind of stuff. The way to get there is to is to sort of add add randomness and try and you know hope it works. And if it doesn't, you quickly pivot. But you have to sort of do things to try and continue to leapfrog. Right, like like for you guys, it's like we're down three, bunting won't help. We need to swing for the fences. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, we we felt obviously with where our team was, but yeah, just in general, like we're we're not the first seed in in the conference, and we definitely have an uphill battle. And you know, we felt that yeah, just adding variance is just gonna is just gonna help us, however it is. And that was that was one way to do it. So I wanted to pull back a little bit. What did Moneyball do for each of you? Reading the book, watching the movie, what did Moneyball do? I'll start with someone who knows Billy Bean. But what was it like reading that book or the idea of Moneyball? How did that change your trajectory? 
Well, I think I still would have had a nine-year career, <laughs> even with all the new analytics. Um, um, no, the whole the whole thing that that was uh, was intriguing me is just to think differently. Uh, like I said, if you think different, then then you have a chance to have an edge. And um, what what really is about the same as what we have now is if we do everything the same, and we've heard it many times as as the top clubs, then the outcome is is is, is going to be, um, you know, we all know where, where we're going to end up every year. So the really the risk of doing it is really not that high, which doesn't mean that that. Uh, the experts, if I want to you know, call them that way, to come out of the sport, that we don't need them anymore. I mean, they're still very valuable. Everybody's trying to create two worlds, but I think uh, the, the, the secret sauce is to, to make these two worlds understand each other and also understanding that one can make the other one better. And at the end of the day, everybody wants credit, uh, credits and everybody wants attention. I mean, that's, that's what we're just like as, as human beings. So uh, you, you make sure you give everybody that. Um, and I think the two worlds together is, 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 the best, uh, is the best way to go. But it all starts with evidence. Every discussion has to start with something that's actually what it is. And then you can start the discussion and ask a guy, you know, you're the expert. You tell me why this is happening instead of if it is happening, yes or no. Joe? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was, Moneyball was a fantastic book. I really enjoyed it. Very inspiring. That was before I was thinking about um, getting into to sports, but um, for sure a, a terrific book. But if I had to point to something in baseball that um, I found um, particularly uh, stimulating intellectually that's influenced me a little bit, I would point to the, um, the Voris uh, McCracken work on uh, uh, defense independent pitching stats. and the, Abbott and stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but the gist of it, as I understand it, is that um, just because a pitcher gave up a lot of singles last season, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, he's going to give up a lot of singles um, next season. The, you know, the, the homers and walks allowed are, are much more um, stable. And um, so that, to me, um, points to like a real um, point of maturation in the sports analytics uh, world with the, the distinction between descriptive stats, like basic facts, and um, uh, predictive analytics. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fact that somebody gave up a lot of singles, but it turns out that there's, I guess, there's a lot of uh, randomness there. Um, that the pitcher can't control. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, um, uh, I tried to promote that way of thinking a little bit. Um, obviously, it was very well established within the machine learning world for many decades. But um, I think it's fair to say, for whatever reason, within the tiny little basketball analytics community, that um, there wasn't as much focus on uh, predictive modeling and out-of-sample testing as of 2010 as th there probably needed to be. Um, and so that was. That was actually, with, the, with my paper, that was um, kind of like a larger goal I was, I was trying to, um, to, uh, to, pro to promote. And uh, um, now you saw the field change very quickly. It, it got much more sophisticated within the next couple of years. Like the second spectrum guys came in, and they're much more sophisticated papers. But for whatever reason, like 2009, 2010, I think basketball index was not, not very mature. But anyway, that Voris McCracken work it kind of connects with me in terms of like forecasting. You know? yeah, like baseball used to be the place where all the data was, and then basketball at the same time when Moneyball came out, it was like no one was doing this stuff. And now we're in reverse, where now basketball has so much data, and baseball, I don't know, comparatively, what, what would you say? Baseball's blowing up in terms of data now. Um, you know, data from Kinetrax and others, all, all, the, all that. But yeah, no, to get to, to, you know, to Joe's point here, the, this idea of, of, of how people think about things in baseball can be really useful, or other, any sport really, but it can be useful to basketball. So as an example, you're talking about essentially all of these metrics and so on are trying to remove as much randomness and control for as many external factors as possible. So take an example, like we used to look at like batting averages, right? Now you look at basically all that matters is what's the input velocity of the pitch and what's the output velocity off the bat, right? So exit velocities are fundamentally trying to remove the randomness of parks and of different pitchers and, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's the same thing in basketball, right? We shouldn't be looking at makes and misses to do field goal percentage. Like that's really, really like, we still do it every day, right? You probably use the word field goal percentage 10 times today. I just hate in, how much I reference. Just in hand, <laughs> common. shoot 60% from the floor last night, what a game. And I'm like, ah, it's terrible. But, but, but we're, we're, that's a super random output, right? So as an example, right? So Tom, let's say you and I go out and we both take, uh, we go to the gym and we both take 10 shots and we both go five for 10. 
OK? Yeah, it'd be so, way lower than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's say we're able to go 5 for 10, right? Yeah. And all of my shots are sort of, um, uh, you know, either I shoot five air balls and five that are like hit the edge of the rim and bouncing in, right? And your five, your, your 10 shots, five of them are swishes, and five of them are like in the rim and out, right? Yeah. We both, mine, we both I shot feel like mine percent. are better, right? Like mine's and more predictively better. Like I would be better going forward than you. And we have that data, so why aren't we using it? Why aren't we? we because it's ingrained. <laughs> so if you think we're so advanced, like that's such a simple thing that we should be doing and we should be better measuring players shooting. It's like, it's a thing that I can explain to 10 seconds to everyone and we have the data to do it, but we don't do it. So it's well, an example who, that- Who says we're not using it? Well, you guys might be. <laughs> um, you, you know, so that's like an example of, that's, that's the equivalent of saying, we're gonna stop measuring home runs, which are the super random zero one binary outcome thing, and start measuring the process that's driving it. Just like, we're, instead of looking at whether you made five out of 10, we're gonna look at what is the arc of your shot, where did it hit the rim, like all that kind of stuff, right? So, and then to, um, to Robert's point, you know, thinking about thinking differently, um, a friend of mine used to work for an NFL team that was not a good NFL team. And so they were going to play, uh, they were about to play a game and it was snowing horribly. And he laughed hardly because his coach was really upset that it was snowing. He's like, oh, we can't play our game, we can't play our style, it's snowing, it's gonna be chaos. He's like, what do you mean? If you're the underdog, you should be doing everything in your power to turn this game into a coin flip, right? So it's like anything that adds randomness to this, this game. As the underdog. As the underdog. Yeah. So to be yeah. clear, the other team does not want it to snow, right? If, if, you're, if you're genuinely good, you want to control everything, right? If, um, so, you know, this is a, a case of, of if you think, always think the same way, like, oh, we're sort of ingrained in our, in our process. But once you step back and say, no, if you're a bad team, you want randomness in any way you can get it. Yeah, like Houston was an early adopter in sport view cameras, uh, but like now we have so much data. Yeah. And now what, how do you find people to do the work that you need? Like you need basketball people, but also people who come from other industries where like this is a cinch. Yeah, well one, one interesting thing is I think all our, all our sports have kind of learned first from baseball, but the, the player tracking data mostly came first to basketball. And so we've had it the longest. And so I've now, uh, been able to repay a couple favors to some baseball friends. We've talked about you know how, how to use some of that data, but yeah, you definitely need, uh, and not just people who can analyze it better. Uh, you know, I started as a programmer, and thank God I'm not doing it anymore. We have much more talented folks who can handle. I mean, we used to get 200 events per game in the play-by-play, -play, and now we're getting thousands of events per second. Uh, the data is just enormous, and you just you simply need the infrastructure, uh, and that's another one where we've learned from other sports who who have had um, you know more data or even other industries like you know you're talking about retail or or finance where they have tons of data and well, how do we actually get this in a form that we can pull it out and give it to our analysts? Uh, but yeah, then you got you know uh, people who have worked with imaging um, and more spatial areas uh, as opposed to like you know a lot of the regressions that that we've kind of started with so. Um, yeah, it's definitely, we had a, a physics major uh, with, with us at one point and like, you know, doing, doing some shot arc stuff and, you know, things that you would never have, have had to do before. So it's definitely opening it up to, uh, you know, I think baseball with the pitch FX, similar, right? There's just, you, you need people with different skills and, uh, and um, you know, it's, it's great. It's another, another place to find an advantage. Uh, switching the conversation to players. So... Are there insights that you can get by playing baseball for f your whole career and then moving into another sport? Because um, Rui Hachimura, I did a story on him for the Washington Wizards. You're familiar with him. Um, and uh, he didn't play basketball until he was like 14. He played baseball until he was 14. And the counterintuitive thing is that actually helped him because it, it, uh, ins we're trying to see if this is going to help, and we don't know, but the miles on, the, on his knees that he would have had if he played AAU in, in the States, uh, he doesn't have that. Uh, he did play a, a lot of Japanese basketball, and it's a lot of miles and a short amount of time for him, but um, that might be the next thing. Where Pascal Siakam playing in Africa, he played soccer and was like running miles on, like, on his tires with the soccer, but it's a different kind of wear and tear on the body than basketball, and I'm wondering... Uh, do you think this is a new trend, is like taking players from other sports and saying, hey, you should try basketball yeah. because it's not going to be as, as much wear and tear on your body? 
Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll point out uh, the, um, the, it's well documented uh, Hachimura's background, and that, that makes us optimistic, as you um, say, about his long term potential as a player and also to, to stay healthy. But um, we also have a guy, Garrison Matthews, um, just on a two way contract, and he's um, looked quite promising. He had 28 points in a game when we beat the Miami Heat. Um, and in high school, he split his time between football and basketball. And he was very lightly recruited coming out of high school. Um, and I think that there might be a story there where, um, like, you know, his initial You're progress... supposed to tell me that story <laughs> and not give it to everyone for oh, free. Oh, right. Yeah, well... A st- yeah, so he played football. Yeah. I, I cleared it with, actually, with Brett Greenberg that I'm allowed to... <laughs> like, it's not too much of a secret, but... Uh, um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, um, uh, it, it, it is interesting to, to, you know, to read the research. There was a, um, David Epstein was on a panel uh, last year when he was talking about the, the research that they, um, people who play a variety of sports when they're younger are, seem to be maybe more likely to, to end up being stars later on. So it's definitely something we've thought about. You know. Where do you fall on that with specialization, early age? No, I, I think one of the bad things we're doing, and it, it all has to do with the war of talent, is, is getting kids... I mean, we get them at age 10, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and all, they, you know, all they were doing is playing soccer. So uh, I look at myself. I played soccer. Actually, I had to, had to choose between baseball and soccer at one point, um, and I, I chose baseball. But I guarantee you that the, I think the reason why I was a decent infielder is because my footwork was, was fairly good, which had, I think, a lot to do with playing soccer. And... It was proven. I think it was the research was done in, in the United States where they looked at 800 Olympians and uh, they saw that until um, age 15, I think they were playing between 2.8 and 3.5 different sports. Uh, and then it would go to 2.6 to 2.8 from 15 to 18. And then uh, after their 19th birthday, uh, it was, I think it was 1.6. But meaning is that I think your motor skills get a lot better by playing a lot of different sports. Not so much the load, but I think they get. It's also proven that these kids get hurt less, uh, mentally uh, stronger. So we have a court in the back where we have a basketball court, we have volleyball, we have different grounds, different surfaces, uh, and and the only uh, thing we give to the kids is just to say, listen, you have to play a tournament. Now, how are you going to do that? Is up to you guys. So we also teach them how strategically to do things instead of just playing soccer all day long. I mean, if you play soccer all day long, you get better at soccer. <clears throat> uh, but we want them to become very good, and it's proven that you have to play different sports, not only foot-eye coordination, but also hand-eye coordination. So we, uh, yeah, we do that as an organization to make sure, because if we don't get these kids at age 10, 11, 12, everybody else is doing it, and then you're going to be uh, too late, and then it doesn't matter what kind of sports you play with them with the rest of the kids you're going to get. I think we've got to be a little bit careful about inferring the direction of causality here. Like we, th- we might say that people who play a lot of sports when they're younger are more likely to be professional athletes or something, right? But it could just be there's a confounder here, which is just a, a, some, even these kids at a young age, their physical abilities. Like if, I, if, if, my, if my kid has someone in their class that's a, like a freak athlete at age seven, I'm going to want that kid to play soccer. Even though he's a swimmer, I want him to come play a naked soccer team, you know? So these, it's like Pascal Siakam could have been good at anything that he did. It's not because he played a bunch of different sports. It's because he's a great athlete. Right. So like, I'm, not, I'm not saying there isn't an influence there, but we should be very cautious about saying like, that's the cause. Because it could just be that you know, if you have very sort of particular physical attributes that you, know, you get pulled into these other sports at a young age, you're going to be better at them, so you're going to stay in them. Um, and then, of course, that also makes you more likely to be a pro athlete. You guys basically found a bunch of middle linebackers for your basketball team. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think one, one thing uh, that kind of Luke, Luke was saying, so obviously basketball, tall, right? If you're tall, people are like, why don't you go play basketball, right? But if you're tall early, and we've seen this with a lot of guys, like you just get thrown the post, right? And, you know, you don't necessarily pick up all these skills, whereas a lot of the guys um, – who, who turn out to be great players. Maybe they had a growth spurt, so they, they were guards earlier. But also they played, maybe played other sports, and that was where they got some of the, the other coordination yeah. that, they, that they didn't get if you, they would have just played basketball and like just been the big man for... Like, do you ask so, athletes that you're like drafting so. in the process? You're like, hey, when did you get your growth spurt? <laughs> like, isn't that, if that's an important it's, variable, like, you want to know that. Yeah, I mean, usually, like, you, you can see it because you'll be like, why do you have such good, you know, ball skills already when you're, when you're you know, 6'10"? But, um, but, yeah, I mean, usually that's that, – if, 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 uh, 
in basketball, they were they had the growth spurt, but if, if they were tall and they played other sports, they could have picked that up uh, regardless. Uh, just off ball, off the wall question: Why aren't there more Bo Jacksons and Deion Sanders in sports now? Like pe- like amazing athletes that play two. We I grew up in Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders, and Danny Ainge played two sports professionally. But why don't we see that now anymore? Kyler Murray, we just saw it, right? So I think it is happening. Wait, say it again. It's like Kyler Murray, like you're seeing oh. it right now. Yeah. Right. I, I'm, I'm not play sure. both sports professionally now. Yeah, but to be a number one pick in both is pretty remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if I mean uh, it, it could have been obviously Bo Jackson and Dion were were two ridiculous athletes, but maybe that's just the the specialization needed, or it could be that people think the specialization is needed and, and don't allow them to do it. Um, I'm sure there's other other things with and Kyler's probably had this, which is like if you're going to invest that much in a guy, you don't want to you know, lend him to other sports, so. Do you guys have theories? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's, the, it's, it's hard to, uh, I mean, I think the off season is important for rest and also for um, working on improving skills and so on. And so, yeah, to be playing two sports. Um, I don't know, didn't Michael Jordan get so burnt out he went and played baseball? Right, but it wasn't going on at the same time, I guess, right? It was a couple years. I know he made a good decision. Yeah. <laughs> <Playing> basketball. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, it's, like I said, I think it's, it's, it's specializing at, at an early age. And I'm sure when, when, when kids get drafted and play pro ball, that, that the, the team that actually drafts them doesn't like that person to play another sport. I think there's a lot of things involved here. But the most important one, I believe, is, is specializing. And American sports are structured a little different than, than they are in Europe because uh, you do have high school here and you have college where you're kind of protected and you can play different sports. But in, in, in Europe, it's, it's different. Like I said, our academy starts at age 10, and every organization is pretty much doing that in Europe. So kids just choose a sport at an early age, and they're not very likely. They might switch positions, but not, not, not a sport. Uh, questions from the audience. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, Robert, how do you incorporate different sports uh, with your younger players at your academy? Like, do you focus on one sport or do you throw them into a different... No, like I said, we have a playground where, where we not only play, you know, we have a basketball court and a volleyball court, but also different surfaces. So, so the, the brain constantly has to adapt not only to, to different movements that you make, but also in different surfaces. And uh, we give them challenges. We, we let them make their own tournaments. Uh, and the rules, they decide themselves. Because kids, in, at least in Holland, you know, they don't play on the streets that much anymore as they used to, because I know my son have to kick him uh, out of, away from the computer, uh, and not the, not the computer the way they use it, but uh, the games. And uh, so just uh, we have to find a way to, uh, to copy what used to be normal in the past, where you play different sports all year, where you play on the street, where you, where you do fall on concrete, where you, uh, and we have to copy that because it's, it's just a fact that kids uh, just don't play outside that much anymore. And, uh, and we do, we do. We realize that we cannot only have them play soccer all day long and expect them to be uh, great athletes. Do you have a basketball hoop in your training ground? Yeah. So we had one at Roma and they played basketball all the time. Watching Mo Salah miss like 15 straight layups is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, free throw in soccer, uh, a throw in, I mean, is, is, is something that happens all the time. And it's, it's very important. There's, there's a lot of goals scored, both on offense and defense, by a wrong throw in. So, you know, if, if, if you don't have any eye and eye coordination, you're not going to be as good as, as somebody that played basketball or baseball or, or volleyball. Um, so it's actually also. Uh, Part of the game. Maybe we should call our game then handball instead of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the throw-in's like a, um, an outlet pass. It would have been great to see a Wes Unseld do a, a soccer throw-in. I think. Well, there's there's guys that actually could, are so strong that it looks like a pass instead of a throw-in. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, good question from Monty here. Uh, how can we facilitate more learning across sports? Should the Rockets, Astros, and Texans be doing regular meetings? And what can you learn about the Astros to win a championship? <laughs> <laughs> Learn or not learn? Um, yeah, we, we uh, 
I'll sidestep that question. <laughs> I wouldn't say my, we. My good friend James Click just got the uh, general manager job, and uh, uh, I'm happy for him uh, that I actually took his spot on this panel. So, uh, but actually met James when when we met with the Rays like 10 years ago, just to see what they were doing, and uh, you know learned a lot from them. But by we you mean the Rockets? The Rockets front office. Was yeah. Like, Let's go. Yeah. Check out what. Yeah, they're... and uh, you know, so I do. I think we seek out. Um, you know, organizations that are doing interesting things. We met with even non, non-sports companies and hedge funds and different things. And one interesting thing, he was talking about this, like, you know, the hedge funds are looking for, for the black swan to avoid it, and, and we're looking for it to, to get it. You know, we, we need that variance. And so it's like, let's just apply what you do, but instead of we're just going to take the opposite. Yeah. So. Do, uh, I, th- I think the Wizards, the Wizards do have, like, a cross-sport uh, monumental uh, front office. Um, what kind of insights are you hoping to learn from having that new structure? Yeah, so uh, the, the monumental basketball, it's across all the, the basketball properties, the, the, the GoGo and the Mystics, and, and you know, the, the vision of ownership is to have a common technology platform that supports them all, and um, there's a, you know, I guess, what do you call economies of scale there, and so, um, so yeah, so we're working on that. Uh, um, we want to make sure to hire the right people, so we've been very careful with that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're definitely optimistic about, about the new structure. Do the Kings do that enough of going to other fields or domains? Yeah, we certainly, you know, proximity to the Bay Area, we had a lot of interesting stuff through. I would say the, most of the, the diversity in terms of getting exposure comes from our sports science group. So, you know, our head strength coach came from hockey, our assistant came from volleyball. So, like, if you look at their backgrounds, it covers, like, six different sports. And so... Um, they're much more diverse in terms of their backgrounds across sports than we are in the front office. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. Like, they've realized that, uh, you know, a hu- in some sense, a human body is a human body. And so making these guys, you, we, this is almost universal across sports. We're trying to make them stronger, jump higher, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, um, you know, it's really common in, in sports science groups and, and in performance groups uh, in, in all sports that these people come with, with broad backgrounds, right? Like, if you work as a, as a, as a, as a physical therapist in the WNBA, you're going to be just as good in the English Premier League or you know, the, the skills transfer over. Got a couple minutes here. Um, when should parents allow their kids to specialize in one sport? Robert. Well, uh, in an ideal world, like I said, it would be probably around 18, 19. Uh, 18 and 19. Yeah, age 18, age 19, playing different sports first, and then, and then, but like I said, the ideal world doesn't exist anymore because if you wait for a, a player when he's 19, uh, you're probably not going to get him anymore. But in an ideal world, I would say 18, 19, yeah, let him, let him play different sports and, and uh, really develop his motor skills and uh, physically, um, but... Um, it's not going to happen. When did you specialize? When did you make that? You said earlier you chose baseball over soccer, but when did you make that choice? Um, I think I was around 16. 16. I was playing for a professional, in the academy of a professional soccer organization, and I was playing in a youth national team for, for baseball. And then it started to overlap uh, the, the times. Uh, the, both programs uh, were, were, were more and more involved, and, and then I had, to cho- I had to choose because one sport would play a tournament and the other one would have a regular season game, and I just couldn't combine it anymore. Uh, otherwise, I would have probably played soccer longer as well. Uh, so I just I chose baseball because I liked it a little, little more than, than soccer. It's crazy that ideally it'd be 19, eight, 18 years old, 19 years old, and now we're at like 10. And like, it's, it's amazing that it's half, half the age. Now. Yeah, and we're actually late. We, we have organization in Holland. I think they start at age seven, seven or eight. Well, I say if, if there's anybody out there that can actually project an eight-year-old to be very good, then I'm going to pay him a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe Billy Bean. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, I want to thank all you guys for, for joining on, me on the panel and uh, learn a ton. So hopefully you guys did too. So thanks for coming out. Okay. Thank you.